Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Middle Way Mom Reads, where we are coming back again and we're continuing to talk about the book Home Education by Charlotte Mason. This is the first book in the Charlotte Mason series. Um, there's a six volume series here. And this is kind of the core book that we've been talking about now for, I think, maybe 12 episodes, somewhere around 10, 12, somewhere in that range. Um, today we're going to talk about living creatures is the section that we're talking about. So last time we talked about um, plant life and how children should be familiar with uh, the different plants that are in their area, be able to name the different trees that are around their home, that this should become familiar to them, that you know, their their world should have names and be things that um, that they can find for themselves. So, going on with this section again about living creatures, um, she says it's best to become friends, right? Friends in quotes here with the animals that are around them, such as squirrels and rabbits, uh, the bees and butterflies, all of these things. Um, and then she talks about somebody who was teaching a class and they were reading about uh, about the bees. They were giving some information about the bees and the kids were wholly uninterested. Um, and she says he suspected the reason in questioning the he says sorry, he suspected the reason in questioning the class, found that not one of them had ever seen a bee. Had never seen a bee. Think for a moment, said he of how much that implies. And then we were moved by an eloquent picture of the sad child life from which bees and birds and flowers are all shut out. This gave me this picture of how many children in our time would also say, I've never seen a bee. And it's not because bees have never been around them. It's that when the bees are around them, we're being rushed from point A to point B from the car to the house, from the store to the car, from school to their after-school activity, that there's never time to, to pay attention, to, to look at their environment around them. And so she goes on to say, children should be encouraged to watch patiently and quietly until they learn something of the habits and history of bee, ant, wasp, spider, hairy caterpillar, dragonfly, and whatever of larger growth comes in their way. She then goes on to give this pretty detailed um, explanation of how you can do this at home. And um, in our time, alhamdulillah, <laughs> you can buy this from Amazon. Um, she was basically talking about how to capture some ants and make it so that you can watch them. Now you can you can order, it's like an ant hill kit, something like that. Um, if you search that on Amazon, I'm sure you can find something. Um, and then you have this in your house and she says it takes them a couple days to kind of get settled in and they, and then they start like building their tunnels and living their normal life in this, in this space that you can watch them. So this was one suggestion that she had to kind of ignite this curiosity in them when that has gone dormant because they just, they're not used to slowing down. And paying attention to these things. Then she goes on to talk about children who are afraid of insects and small animals, right? The child who is afraid of a rabbit or so here in Minnesota, snakes are not generally dangerous. Um, I think there's a couple that they could bite you. You're not going to die. Um, so, but like we have these gardener snakes or gar garden snakes. Um, they're very small. Um, <laughs> one of them bit one of my kids and like, it didn't even leave a dent. Um, they're just very, uh, benign. So these type of things, when the children are afraid of things that really are benign, we have to ask ourselves, did they learn this from the adults in their life? And so this is something we have to choose how we react when they go to pick up a garden snake, right? If you live in Texas or Alabama or what have you, this is different. We, we traveled to Texas 
uh, a few years ago and we went camping in the desert and I had to tell my kids, listen, you do not pick up snakes in Texas. The snakes in Texas are different than the snakes in Minnesota. Like this is just totally different ball game. We don't do that here. Um, but there should be, so there should be like this healthy fear of the things that should be feared. But if they're things like so afraid of a bumblebee, which unless you're really chasing that thing down and trying to kill it yourself, that thing is not coming after you. It's not going to sting you. So when, when they watch something for a long time, they should, or I'm sorry, they should have this opportunity to watch something for a long time without being afraid. If you do find that they are afraid, there's, you know, try to try to uh, increase the exposure and model that behavior of just being curious. Oh, I wonder what they're doing. That bee doesn't seem to be angry. So I, I don't think that I need to worry about that. Um, and then you're communicating things like, that this is a bear. <laughs> this is something we do need to worry about. Having this clarity of anything non-human isn't necessarily something to be afraid of, um, but there should be a healthy fear of certain things. And that might take some relearning within yourself. I do not pick up snakes. My children like to pick up snakes. I do not pick up snakes. Um, and I've had to hold it within myself to not be like grossed out and to not be afraid because those were things that I, you know, I don't know if that was inherent in me, if I picked that up, you know, as a child from other people, but, um, that was something that I had to relearn within myself. It is possible to relearn new habits. Okay. So going back to allowing them to observe something and to watch something for, for a long period of time. Um, there's one example where one of my kids, we have a very simple swing set, um, you know, just like wood platform slide, um, couple swings. And she was laying underneath the wood platform, just, I don't know, watching the clouds go by. <laughs> and she came inside and she was like, I was just watching the, the bees make a nest. And I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? And underneath the platform where she was just kind of laying there, you know, they would make it kind of like into a fort. There is uh, paper wasps were making a nest there. And so she got to, she was able to describe it. And we did talk about like, this is a place where there's some healthy fear. You were very close to that wasp nest and granted, you know, nothing bad happened. Um, everything was fine. And so that was a learning experience, I guess, for both of us. But when they have these, these periods of time and they have these descriptions that they can give you, what's best is to write those down. If that would be hard for them to do that, ask them to draw a picture about it. Um, and when you write that down and you have the picture later on in life, they can go back to that. And it's like a treasured memory. So um, there's a curriculum, I think it's still around from Brave Writer, it's called Jot It Down. And the whole idea is starting to encourage children to tell stories, or to tell about the things that they saw, the things that they were thinking about the stories that they've come up with. And so like some of the some of the um, activities like one is like my 10 favorite things. And so it's putting them into a list, an ordered list, and being able to describe those things. And the reason why it's called jot it down is because uh, the advice is you as the parent are writing everything, because you want that idea to get up and out before you're requiring them to write it for themselves, because that idea is what's most important. And then writing it down that comes later. So this paves the way to narration, which is a cornerstone in the Charlotte Mason education. So the next section is about the force of public opinion in the home. So this is talking about if the child has that time of just sitting and observing, let's say an anthill, and they come and they tell you about it and you are wholly uninterested, this is going to shut that door for them in a large way. This is going to make it where they don't want to participate in this anymore because they're not getting that feedback. They're, 
recognizing that this isn't anything, this isn't interesting. This isn't cool. It's not fun. But when we, when we show that interest in them, that it continues to open that door where next time when they see these things, they want to tell you all about it. And when they know that they want to tell you all about it, then they're paying closer attention to the details of these things. So a motto that I like to have um, in our home for myself and my kids, um, I first thought about it when it came to like the tween teen years, um, is be interested not just interesting. So this means when somebody is telling me a story, I'm asking them more questions about it. I'm curious about them, not just waiting for them to shut up so I can tell them something also that's like, hey, and blah, 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 blah about me. I think this is, for some people, this comes easier than others. Um, but it's something that we have to focus on too with our kids. When they tell us the small tidbit that they learned, if we know a gallon full of information about this, are we now turning on that fire hose and just blabbing and blabbing and blabbing about what we know? Or are we interested in what they have to say as well? What a good way to inculcate this as well is to bring them to places and to be curious with them. So um, <laughs> this uh, this reminds me so much of we would, we've been hiking in a number of places, so national parks in particular, and we would get to the summit where, it, oh, subhanAllah, the view is amazing. And we're just sitting there and, you know, for us kind of like uh, one of our habits is when we get to one of these places, we sit down and we have a snack. We sit down and we have some water and we just take a break and we just, we're just in that place. And as you're just sitting in that place, you see how many people come to that spot, take a selfie and leave. So it's this checkbox of, I was here, I was in this interesting place. I am interesting because I went to this place and I have this picture to show it. And I'm not trying to be judgmental here, but I am trying to focus on our attitude when we come to this place. Are we soaking it in? Because I can tell you there's no camera in the world that is going to be able to take in that picture the way that your eyes can, especially your iPhone. Your iPhone isn't doing it, especially when your face is taking up half of that picture. That's like, it's not that interesting. Also, when we're doing these things, when we are interested in these outings that we have, expect it to go really, really slow. I now have this, um, you know, I have a fitness tracker or watch, whatever. And so while I'm on these walks, um, like I said, it to go on a walk and then it shows me stats along the way. And for the most part, I'm doing this just to kind of track exercise and those type of things. And even when I rush the kids along, and granted, my youngest is eight, so things are going faster than they used to. We're going longer distances than we used to. Still, on average, we go one mile an hour. It is sometimes, sometimes it's painfully slow. So just expect it's going to take time. Bring some snacks, bring some water. Just know you are there for the experience. Your heart rate as an adult is not going to be raised. You need to go on a different walk for that purpose. The next section is talking about what town children can do. I think most of us now are kind of in this place of we're not, you know, right next door to, you know, some nature preserve. Um, it is, though, interesting. I have mentioned this before, but she's talking about, like, the slums of London. So now we have, like, the park and rec board. You know, they plant trees along, like, these broadways and whatever. So I think things look a little bit different now. Uh, your cities are a lot greener now than I think when she was writing about this at, like, if I'm aligning this right, and maybe I'm not, so you're going to, you can shoot me down in the comments of being wrong in history, that this is kind of like in the peak of like the industrial era that you have. Um, there's no um, 
you know, uh, like environmental laws, um, just when she calls it the slums of London, we can all kind of picture what that looks like. And probably what we live in is better than that. Still, in that context, there's a lot to see in the city. There's uh, the squirrels and the birds. The birds are still there. If you slow down long enough to watch. So a couple ways that we can kind of open this door for ourselves and for our children, just open the curtains to a window when you're eating breakfast and sit near that window. Don't sit there with your phone in front of you, your tablet, a magazine. Just sit there and just look out the window. If you can sit on a deck or a patio, even better. But don't have something else that you're looking at. Um, another option is you can set up a bird feeder. There's uh, bird feeders where you can like stick it to the window and it's like see-through and you put the bird feed there. There's some where like if you have the up-down opening windows that you can put it in that space and close the window around it. Um, and you can put the bird feed in there. There's a lot of ways to attract that nature to you. Um, just watching the squirrels go for food. Uh, a friend of mine that lives in the city, she said that if you watch, you will watch the squirrels chew through the gar like the thick plastic garbage cans um, to get the food that's inside. <laughs> so that like that's a whole story to tell in and of itself. Um, she goes on to really like seal in this case that this personal observation is more valuable than any book that you can read. This is a habit with its own reward. This habit of observation has its own reward in the things that you see. In this, um, this book doesn't really get into the idea of internal locus of control, external locus of control. It assumes that you're working toward an internal locus of control, right? I am doing good work because that's valuable to me that I have made that a priority. Um, not because I'm going to get a sticker on a charge or somebody is going to tell me that I did a good job or I'm going to get a better grade, so on and so forth. So having this where like the reward in and of itself, the reward is built in. The joy is in the activity itself. If you just slow down long enough to enjoy it. She goes on to say, for the evil is that children get their knowledge of natural history, like all their knowledge, at second hand. They are so sated with wonders that nothing surprises them, and they are so little used to see for themselves that nothing interests them. The cure for this blasé condition is to let them alone for a bit and then begin on new lines. And this is I, what really hit home for me are they are so little used to see for themselves that nothing interests them. They look around, it's a tree, it's a tree, it's a tree. I remember driving through Iowa as a kid and I would just say, why do people live here? There's nothing here. It's just corn and cows and corn and cows. And if I knew a little bit more about the things I was looking at, maybe it would have been interesting. I don't know. I mean, it was a lot of corn and cows in the 80s and 90s. So maybe it was a lot of corn and the same kind of cows. But if I knew the different kinds of cows, I wonder if that would have made that trip slightly more interesting, slightly more tolerable. Um, so letting the children alone. That doesn't mean letting them alone on their, so when they are on a device and they're being entertained by that device, they're not being let alone. Boredom is the cure for this problem. Being bored and having to figure out how to entertain yourself without destroying things this is a skill that a lot of children are missing. And I will say even, you know, my own children, it's something that we have to manage. So, you know, I, this is, um, there's not a perfect place. There's never a place where like, all of a sudden now your children are like, oh, mashallah, mother, you know what I saw? I saw blah, 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 blah. And like, everything is like that. And they never say that they're bored. Just understand this is a journey and it's valuable to start on the journey and get going. In the next section, she says, nature, nature knowledge is the most important for young children. 
There is no sort of knowledge to be got in these early years so valuable to children as that which they get for themselves in the world they live in. Let them once get touch with nature and a habit is formed which will be a source of delight through life. So observing the world is a joy. Being able to just sit back and observe the world. But our current, in our current time, our focus is more on how the world is observing us. So again, talking about sitting and taking in this view from like, not the mountaintop, but the mountainside, right? Sitting and taking in this view from the mountainside versus taking a view of yourself on the mountainside, how the world sees you versus you seeing the world. This is, uh, this is something that we have to inculcate within ourselves and within our children that we are, there's value in things outside of ourselves. There's value in things outside of ourselves if we are just curious enough to look. The next section is called Mental Training of a Child Naturalist. She says, consider too what an unequaled mental training the child naturalist is getting for any study or calling under the sun. The powers of attention, of discrimination, of patient pursuit, growing with his growth, what will they not fit him for? So this, again, the habit of attention, the habit of observation, whether they, whether they become like a botanist later in life, whether this is something that becomes their life's passion or not, these skills, these habits that they're building, this will serve them well in IT as a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, what have you. All of these are built on these habits. So it doesn't look, um, it doesn't look studious from the outside, but it really is the first building blocks of a studious life, inshallah. Um, I found it interesting. Uh, Charlotte Mason even said in here that children are more well-behaved when they're always kept well amused. And this is, so she is talking about the kids being able to amuse themselves. Not that we are their personal jester, their personal, like, what I saw this article, it was like parents now are treating their children like luxury uh, tourists, you know, oh, and now look at over here. And now we're going to take you on this bus ride over there and we're going to have snacks and whatever, like that the child is able to amuse themselves. This will result, inshallah, in better behavior. So this is, they're able to create their own games by having just a ball to play with or some sticks or um, uh, somebody asked pretty recently about um, what do you do to keep kids amused when you're camping? Mm. And <laughs> I have opinions about this, um, but just like as an example, we went camping one time and so my children found like, it was like a pineapple, or pine, not a pineapple, a pine cone and some moss and some little sticks and some acorn tops. And they made like this little town for their like little people that they made with these like sticks and whatever. And like this, this is how children have played for millennia. There's no reason to think that we all of a sudden in the last hundred years have become wholly incapable of playing like this again. And it's not just putting on a pedestal how, how we used to do things. It's when a child is able to look around them and find things to uh, spark their imagination, then they are more well-behaved because they're not expecting other people to do for them what they're able to do for themselves. They're not expecting other people to entertain them because they can entertain themselves. Okay, I'll get off my little soapbox here. The last section here is uh, field lore in the naturalist books. So when we talk about nature study, we're like, what books should I buy? And you'll notice we've talked a lot about nature study so far, and not once have we mentioned a book. Because nature study should begin 80% without books. 90%, maybe 95%. I don't know. I haven't like really sat down and done the math. But nature study begins with no books. Then you can bring books in 
as a way of kind of opening those doors of things they have not yet discovered. Also, when you're viewing nature and you're observing nature, there should be a reverence for life. Uh, Charlotte Mason says, reverence for life as a wonderful and awful gift, which a ruthless child may destroy but never can restore, is a lesson of first importance to the child. So this means that when you're looking at a flower, you're not ripping it apart to see the insides. So you might use a book to see what those, what the inside of that flower looks like because this is part of creation and we're not going to get in the habit of tearing that apart. We don't want to build within children that we are, that we're the commanders of this, of creation, right? Underneath Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but still like that we, that we can tear things apart. You know, for instance, like when we're walking down the road, are children just tearing all the leaves off of the tree? No. There's reverence for that created thing. Allah created this. Who are we to harm it? There should be this idea that if we are going to have an impact on it, it needs to be for a purpose. So if we are going to kill an animal, if we're going to rip out a plant, it is going to be because we need it, because there's some purpose to it. And so starting with this attitude, then when children get into the further sciences, they realize that there's some sacrifice that has to be made in order to study these sciences. So that is taking the, the, the flower apart. That is, I mean, in human biology, that was doing, uh, what is it called? Autonomy, autonomy um, anatomy. It is autopsy. Sorry. <laughs> doing an autopsy, you know, and this was very controversial when people started to do it. But because of that sacrifice that was made, we were able to better understand the human body, right? It brought us forward in science because we did that, but we started with the reverence of, for life. And when we're bringing children out in nature, that needs to be core. That needs to be a focus, inshallah. She goes on to talk about rough classification should be something that they're able to do. So this is being able to describe the leaves on a plant that maybe they're heart-shaped or they're long or they're round or they're pointed, um, that they are whole or divided leaves, that they have crisscross veins or straight veins, uh, they have bell-shaped flowers or cross-shaped flowers, right? These are ways that we can classify the different plant life that's around them. And then they'll start classifying animal life as well. So they should be able to describe in these ways. And this is another way where books really come in handy is that we can give these descriptions that are pretty standard um, of having like alternating leaves or opposite leaves. Um, so meaning like here's your stem, you know, your stem is going up and down and do the leaves do two leaves come out at the same point or do they kind of take turns? Uh, so there's kind of like standard vernacular for that. And that's, again, where books would really come in handy is having that standard vernacular. She says, to make collections of leaves and flowers pressed and mounted and arranged according to their form affords much pleasure. And what is better, valuable training in the noticing of differences and resemblances. Patterns for this sort of classification of leaves and flowers will be found in every little book of elementary botany. Again, so this is how we can use those books. Um, but still what they learn from for themselves, the things that they write down or you write down for them. Um, I just want to say that for a lot of Charlotte Mason homeschoolers, children are still having their parent or their teacher write for them into third grade, maybe into fourth grade, because it's really important to get those ideas down before we expect them to have good grammar and punctuation and spelling and all of this. So we should not be shy to write down for them of these classifications or these descriptions that they have. Um, but the books are a supplement because the books are not going to teach them all that they need to know. And they're not, they're really not going to remember everything from the book, but they're going to remember the things that they saw 
that they observed. And especially if those observations were communicated to somebody else, they're going to remember that even more. And then lastly, she ends with talking about what we should do as the mothers and teachers, that we should be reading up on nature study and observing as well. So like I said, we should also be curious with the children. It shouldn't be go out there and be curious. Come back and tell me what you found. That we're going out there and saying, oh, I never noticed this before. I've never seen this type of woodpecker before. It's so big, like the pleated woodpecker. It's like the size of a crow. I've seen it once in my life. And it was like an exciting time. So I talked about it with my kids. And this is modeling that behavior. And it's not just for the sake of I'm going to do this so that way you copy me. It's we are now a family of curious people. We're now a family that pays attention. We're now a family that uh, that enjoys being outside or even just watching the outside if there's something that's keeping us physically inside. and and just to having that quiet moment to just see what's there. So there should be time that we spend in our own time reading naturalist books, reading um, not just field guides. I think a lot of times we look at field guides and we're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to read. It's like reading the dictionary, right? Like how many of those words do you really remember? But there's, um, there's a lot of uh, naturalist books where they really dig into how to read water. I have this book. Um, I don't think you can see it from here, but it's like the cloud spotters guide. And it's like the cloud appreciation society. So these are things that we should be building into our day-to-day -day lives inshallah. And that wraps us up for this section. Uh, the next section will be talking about, um, getting knowledge by means of his senses. So we've been talking about this a little bit, but we'll dig into it a little bit deeper, inshallah. Again, you will get more out of this book if you're reading it yourself. You can find it at a lot of different retailers. Um, I will have a link to that in the description of this podcast or YouTube video. And then if you have any questions, you can email me at Shannon, S-H-A-N-N-E-N, -N -N, at middlewaymom.com. Thank you so much and assalamu alaikum.